Hi, I'm Andy Weibel, and welcome to Timely Topics. Today I'm talking with Kurt Troutman. He's professor of history and political science at Muskegon Community College, and he's here to tell us about Muskegon's own boogie woogie bugle boy, Clarence Zeilman. Welcome, Kurt. Hi, Andy. Thanks for having me on here today, and I'm really excited to talk about this new project here in Muskegon. Yeah, you put a little time into putting together a documentary about uh, Clarence Zeilman. Um, and and we're, I want to hear a lot about this uh, new statue that's going to be going up. But uh, first, who is Clarence Zilman? Clarence Zilman, born here in Muskegon in 1906, died in 1988. A remarkable man who lived an ordinary life but had some tremendous imprints on our society. Mm -hmm. Most of us are familiar with the World War II song, the Boogie Woogie Bugle Boy of Company B. Yeah, I think we can all hear it as you say it. We sure can. Famous song performed by the Andrews Sisters. They did a great job with it. Well, as it turns out, this song inspired a man, Clarence Zillman, who really fits the words of the song. He was born in Muskegon, moved to Chicago, got drafted later in life at the ripe old age of 36, wow. and entered the World War II as a bugler and changed many ways uh, the music of the war by taking ordinary taps and jazzing them up. Mm -hmm. He became a legend in the Army and afterwards and kind of immortalized by this great song, the Boogie Woogie Bugle Boy of Company B. He's a Muskegon native. Yeah, he, did, he grew up here, right? He sure did. Right downtown Muskegon on Irwin Street. Uh, like many musicians of the time, traveled the country, but maintained Muskegon as his home. When he was done performing, uh, lived in Muskegon full time, worked at Continental Motors until his passing in 1988. Wow. Now, now he, he went to school here, he grew up here, and then he took off and performed, right? Certainly. He was a proud big red and um, dropped out of school in his 11th grade year in 1921. Just felt that music was his calling. Mm -hmm. Moved to Chicago. Uh, He's pretty young to move to Chicago. Very young. Bust on the streets and was picked up by this brand new newfangled technology thing called radio and WBBM radio. What did you say he did on the streets? Uh, a busking is the term. What, what, what does that mean? Yeah, that's playing on the streets, on the street corner, playing, you know, really honing your craft yeah. for people that walk by that might throw some small change in your box or they might scoff at you. Yeah, right. So. I think Bruno Mars had a similar uh, I musical think so background. Too. So. Well, I think every musician, uh, no matter how talented they are, would say that busking on the street, that's really, I uh, take some chops. It yeah, really does. That, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So he went on the radio, and then what, what happened? He was picked up by the WBBM Orchestra, mm -hmm. which was one of the first radios in 1922. And here he is, a young man at 18, 19 years old, playing professional music. Mm -hmm. And he would continue there until one of the top bands of the day, Paul Speck, would find him on that radio and invite him to play with him. And from there, his career would simply take off to the very top levels so the of Paul music. the Paul Speck Orchestra, that was pretty popular. Yes, it was. Yeah, the Paul Speck Orchestra was really one of the premier orchestras in the 1920s. In fact, the 1929 inauguration of President Herbert Hoover, they had many different bands, but the premier dance band at the inauguration was the Paul Speck Band. Wow. And Clarence Zillman was one of them, one of, played, played at the there. 1929 inaugural ball. Wow, right before the crash of it all. And that's really the key. Uh, when the Great Depression ca came, uh, over two-thirds of the musicians were out of work, much like the rest of the country, mm -hmm. and thus he would leave this premier orchestra that would effectively dissolve, move back here to Muskegon. Okay. Playing in different places, uh, actually played down in Grand Haven with something called the Tannery Boys Band. The Eagle Ottawa Tannery uh, put money out for a band, and he was one of them and played throughout uh, West Michigan. But like many people of the Depression era, really struggling. They talked about uh, playing for $2 a night 
and all the boiled eggs they could eat. <laughs> what a deal. <laughs> exactly, what a deal. Yeah. Uh, and then in the 1940s, he'd be picked up again by another leading orchestra, the Tommy Tucker Orchestra. And okay. they were just absolutely at the zenith of their field. Right, but he obviously didn't last long if then he... Well, he lasted as long as Uncle Sam would allow wow. him. Right, right, the war was... And thus he got started. drafted. Yeah. But his real claim to fame came after the creation of a song. So we get back to the Boogie Wiggy Bugle Boy of Company B. The U.S. Army requested this song to be written, and the Andrews sisters performed it wonderfully. And from there, that would be pinned on to Clarence Zillman, and his career would forever change. Right. So the song comes out in 1941, but uh, Clarence Zillman, he, uh, he goes in, when does he go into the military? He's drafted in 1942. And like I say, the Don Ray was the author of the song. Yeah. He crossed paths with Clarence in Chicago, uh, was very um, much familiar with the Tommy Tucker band. Yeah. Did he write it about Clarence? Well, history is not quite uh, clear. On tease that out went yeah. completely. What I would like to do, let's play a clip of this song for the audience. From the Andrews sisters? Certainly. All is right. That, all right. Sounds good. Let's do it. He was a famous trumpet man from out Chicago way. He had a boogie style that no one else could play. He was the top man at his craft. But then his number came up and he was gone with the draft. He's in the army now, a blowing reveille. He's the boogie woogie bugle boy of Company B. They made him blow a bugle for his uncle Sam. It really brought him down because it couldn't jam. The captain seemed to understand. Because the next day the cap went out and drafted a band. And now the company jumps when he plays reveille. Well, that was great, Kurt. Uh, we, I think we've all heard that song before. Oh, we certainly have. It just, it just brings a good feeling yeah. with this jump blues music. And as Clarence went into the army, drafted by Uncle Sam, he, in part motivation from that song, decided to change all of the notes of the various reveille calls. And so... As a company bugler. So he was uh, jazzing up what he, very his much. job was. Right? He was, for obvious reasons, assigned to be a company bugler, mm -hmm. which is really very, very low skill, quite simple for a top flight yeah, musician right. to play those bugle notes. And so he changed them, jazzed them up, and as legend has it, it's pretty well documented, into the general's office he was called, expecting to get completely dressed down and busted. That general would say it was the finest music he's ever heard. Hmm. And this probably, they were recognizing how this helped morale and whatnot. Oh, very much. The leading newspaper of the Army and of really many people was Stars and Stripes. And they came out with an article that clearly identifies Clarence Zillman as the Boogie Woogie Bugle Boy. Wow, wow. So they really were uh, proud and, and saw him as important. They were. And in fact, I'd like to play another clip that kind of highlights this and shows us how not just Stars and Stripes, but many newspapers throughout the country, over 50 newspapers, ran stories about this bugler. Okay. Yeah, let's go. Another clip from uh, Kurt's documentary. First appearing on March 19, 1943, in the London edition of Stars and Stripes magazine, Private Zillman of Muskegon, Michigan, is acknowledged as the Boogie Woogie Bugle Boy. This article was reprinted in over 30 newspapers in the United States, England, and Scotland. The U.S. Army had clearly identified Clarence Zillman as the Boogie Woogie Bugler, and the Army is never wrong. Because the next day the cat went out and drafted a band, and now the company jumps when he plays reveille. He's the Boogie Woogie Bugle Boy. The Muskegon native had become famous. Army buglers all over the theater were contacting Clarence, seeking his help in writing revised scores of various bugle calls. The remainder of his service would be spent training buglers and entertaining troops throughout Europe. Well, Kurt, that's pretty interesting that uh, all those stories and background to see that Clarence Seilman was the boogie woogie bugle boy. <laughs> Let me say that better. Boogie woogie bugle boy. Sorry. <laughs> he was extraordinary, and I really think so. So after the war, he would come back to Muskegon 
and understanding that he's been out of professional music for numerous years, yes. thousands of musicians are coming back, and maybe there's not a, a place for him touring in the premier orchestras anymore. Mm -hmm. And being at an older age, he's also thinking, well... So when, when did he get out of the military? Uh, at the end of the war, so he okay. actually got he home in late 1945. All right. So, so he's pushing he's 40. 40 years old, yeah. yes. And you know, starting to look at different things in his life. Of course, he would always play, and he would play here locally in town, places like the Fruitport Pavilion, uh, downtown at the uh, Veteran of Foreign Wars Club, many different places, and pretty much any place he played, that was his signature farewell song for the night, was to finish it, was and the crowd just always adored him. Oh, wow, that's great. But he, he's pretty much stayed here in Muskegon then for after the war. Yes, he did. Mm -hmm. And he worked at Continental Motors? Correct, yeah. He went to work with Continental Motors. Interesting enough, with many of his former bandmates from the Great Depression and the Tannery Boys Band out of Grand Haven. Hmm. So, so it, when he was in the military, would, uh, would people have known him? And uh, did, was he like a star? Yes, he was. Um, almost immediately. He got taken out of his unit, put into a special services band. Okay. He traveled Europe performing, as well as buglers all over the theater were writing him and asking him to change and revise their scores so they too could play these uh, jump blues reveille. Wow, that's pretty neat. So, um, about your documentary, uh, how would one go about seeing this? To, to get even more information than you've just given us. Well, it's a splendid musical journey of a wonderful period in time. And right now, um, I've been playing this throughout the Muskegon area mm -hmm. at a variety of different libraries and community organizations. And we're doing this to promote the documentary, but most of, mostly to promote the second half of this program, right. which is a memorial statue what we're building here in Muskegon, right, right. dedicated to Clarence Zimmerman. So we just got to keep a lookout for you for the documentary. That and, we do. Uh, um, and, and, but you will be having it around the community. And uh, I know you've produced it through the school here and have a lot of uh, thanks probably for uh, people here that have helped you. The college has been wonderful. Uh, many, many of the faculty that have helped me with researching, as you know, as a fellow scholar, all research starts and ends, not online with Google, but in our library. Mm -hmm. And I like to always say that librarians, librarians don't know anything. They know everything. Yeah. And they, uh, we can't do our job without the librarians doing their yeah. job. So the research that I'm really indebted to many of my colleagues here, both in the faculty, uh, in our history department, other departments, in particular our librarians. That's good. And yes, our television studio. Okay. Rad, Rod Van Nortwick, uh, in, invaluable to help create this product. His fingerprints are all over it in a very, very positive way. Yeah. Literally uh, hundreds of hours, I'm sure. Uh, and that is, that is very true. Yeah. And so, so then this, how'd this inspire this idea of the statue? Well, the project was complete. I was actually on the way back from a student trip uh, coming from Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. And one of my colleagues in the art department, Mr. Tim Norris, suggested that you've finished the film, now it is time to take the next step and create public art. And yeah, I'm a historian. I, 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 I got a few friends <laughs> named Art, but that's as close <laughs> as I get. So. So, but you, you kind of ran with this idea of it. Well, with this idea, yes, I approached the uh, Muskegon Downtown Arts Committee. Okay, and what, and tell us about that committee. Well, it's a, an ad hoc committee that involves people from the Art Museum, mm -hmm. from a few other museums, the Lakeshore Museum particularly, and the LST Veterans Museum, as well as the Community Foundation. Nice. And uh, went to them, and they've, they've been instrumental in doing this over the years. Mm -hmm as we've watched our city kind of grow, not just in population, but in various pieces of public art. Right, right. And, and, and uh, we do have uh, Buster Keaton downtown. Certainly. Little, uh, and and yeah. so this will kind of add to that, but where did you say this is, piece will be? This, when, upon completion, this is going to be placed 
out in front of the LST okay. Veterans Museum. From the uh, door of the LST out to the walking trail along Seaway, it's going to be placed about three quarters of the way so you can access it as a patron at the, at the museum. Mm -hmm. Or if you're walking okay. down the walking trail, yeah. it'll be about six, seven feet off the trail. Okay. The Mart Doc has been very generous in donating property. They prepared the site with a small little uh, berm, so it's about a six foot berm ah. uh, that's going to hold a life-size statue. Nice, nice. Now, um, you say walking. I think also people bike and run on that. Too. Bike and running they trail. They can stop, the, right? The pedestrian trail. <laughs> okay. Yes, they sure can. And but you'll be able to see it in your, that, from your car. Yeah, and so and life size, and so how, how tall are we thinking? Six foot or so? Right about that. Clarence Zuman himself was a relatively small man. He was about five foot six, okay. 140 pounds. Wow, okay. Well, so I assume that, and that's going to come with the artist. And what's interesting about this, the Downtown Art Committee agreed to support this project, they said, great, we're, we're willing to help you. So there's two steps to it. Yeah. First is to select, interview, and commission an artist, and then second is to raise the funds. Sure, sure. So okay. let's uh, start with the first one. How did you go about finding an artist? Well, I was in many ways charged with doing this. Andy, I'm a historian. Yeah, right, right. Um, I, this was science, out of my historian. comfort zone. Yeah. So we put out basically a general call for this. Call for proposals. Correct. Yeah. And admittedly, there are certainly many skilled people, but not, numerically, not that many people that produce full-size bronze statues right. for public art. Mm -hmm. And I was really proud when the entire committee agreed upon it when we... Well, how many, first, how many people applied and returned we your call for We had increase from about a dozen. About a dozen, a dozen people were, were inquired about this. Uh -huh. and, and so you have formed a committee? We sure did. And, and upon looking at the proposals, the winning proposal was submitted by a young man, 21 years old, a Muskegon native, a Muskegon Community College graduate, yeah. currently at Northern Illinois University as an art student, and his name is Ari Norris. Right, right, and uh, related to Tim Norris that you referred to earlier, right? In many ways, more happenstance than anything else. Okay, yeah. yeah. All right, so, so now uh, Tim, or, uh, Ari is the artist. Does he have any uh, background, or how did you decide to pick him? Like any type of project, you want as many bids as possible. Mm -hmm. We put this out for a public bid. We got about 12 inquiries. Not all of those were formal bids. Quite frankly, not many of them were formal bids. Not being in the art community, I'm not sure I really know what entails a formal bid or not. Right. But we went through there. We were looking for something as detailed as possible to, exp you know, to propose what's it going to cost and where those costs are going you, to be out there. You had there. a committee that looked this over. We sure did. We had a committee of four with the Downtown Arts Committee. Okay. And we were pretty unanimous when we selected. And, and you selected Ari. Correct. Ari Norris, again, a Muskegon Community College graduate. Uh, he's been working at the Art Museum over the years. He's had many different exhibits there uh, as a young student. Yeah. He's going to art school right now in Northern Illinois University. And again, probably what was most impressive about him is that he spent two summers as an intern with a world-renowned yeah. Gary Castill at Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. So the type of statue we'll have here will be the same type we, you can see if you go to Gettysburg. Absolutely, yes. It will be a, effectively a roughly six-foot-tall bronze statue of a bugler with bugle in hand, military uniform on a pedestal with proper adornments on the bottom. Nice, nice. And so this, this type of statue would probably be helpful for tourism, for attracting people to the LST. Is that part of the idea? It sure will. Like I say, at the LST, you'll see that right when you pull up, and they get about six to 7,000 visitors every summer. Mm -hmm. And it's hard not to come out and take a look at this impressive statue. And, and when we go in, will there still be more things about Clarence Zillman if people would want to find yes, out? Yes, we're putting together an exhibit to be inside, exactly, to be open, that to kind of mirror with the outside. Yeah, because I'm sure it'll pique people's interest. Yes, want it will. To know more. Because it's a great Muskegon story about a song that virtually everybody knows from this era. Yeah. 
And songs always have some elements of, you know, realism behind them. Well, this was a man that lived this song. Right, right. He became mm -hmm. the Boogie Woogie Bugle Boy. He sure did. And um, many people still know of him. Mm -hmm. I was given a presentation just recently on the film, and I asked, did anybody know of him? And a gentleman put his hand up. He was, oh, in, in his early 90s, he says, I was a fighter pilot. I never met him even though I'm from Muskegon as well, but I knew of him during the war. Wow, he's that. So we knew of him. Yeah. And I was very surprised with that, pleasantly surprised. Right, right. Mm -hmm. And I think probably everyone knows the song. Uh, even it's if they just, don't know Clarence Silver. And when you play it, you can't help but feel a little tapping. That yeah. Woogie Woogie Jump Blues is just very attractive. Right, it right. It really is. Yeah, the attractive Andrews sisters, you had an attractive song and it, really, it just it was, made for a good pairing, it yeah, really does. Right. So the art committee has been very supportive. With all of Muskegon downtown art, this will be one more piece mm -hmm. to add to our community. Right. Again, accessible at the museum, accessible by the pedestrian trail, uh, ex uh, visual by the seaway when you yeah. drive by. And, it, and it's kind of neat that uh, both Clarence Zillman and Ari Norris are products of Muskegon. I think that is so essential. That was not an absolute requirement for the artist to be from here, mm -hmm. but what a benefit, what a joy. Yeah. So again, the, the project involved two things, selecting an artist and then raising the funds right, to right. pay for the I do part. remember, uh, I never had Ari in a class, but I do remember a student who I did have talking about Ari once saying, uh, he was just almost awestruck how well, uh, or how good of an artist he was. And uh, he just said, no, no, he's an artist. <laughs> so well, Ari comes from a family of artists. Both his parents are both professional artists. I was pleased to have him in a history class years ago, a Civil War history class where we traveled to Gettysburg. And that's how he got familiar with uh, the statues there. And Correct. And so that's where he met artist Gary Castillo. To thank and you for uh, getting him connected there, I guess. Well, we know how that works. Uh, partnership at, at, at our age, it is wonderful to pass it down to the next generation because we all have help. We've stood on someone's sure. shoulders. It's nice to see a young person thriving and prospering. And I just truly believe that Ari is just one of these fine young fellows we are proud to have here in Muskegon. I, I agree. So you said uh, it's about $40,000. How do you raise $40,000? That, you know, I started with lottery tickets and casino visits, and that <laughs> didn't do real well. <laughs> well, it was worth a shot, I guess. Like everything, community support. Uh, showing the film at various veterans organizations, uh, nursing home, community uh, gatherings, libraries, tremendous interest in the film, in the project, in the story. Donation letters, the Muskegon Foundation has yeah. been just extraordinary as okay. far as their organization of this. All donations are sent to the Community Foundation for Muskegon yeah. to go into this account. Wow. And when you look at our list of donors, it has been uh, just almost scores and scores and scores of small donors. That's great. That's great. So people all have a, a hand in this. They do. I was privileged to uh, show the final documentary to um, a Clarence Zillman family reunion. And this was a lot of fun. Now, he did not have any children. So the family are mostly uh, cousins, uncles, second or, th or three times removed. Whether this was good or bad, I hope it was good. It brought tears to their eyes. I bet. So I think it was a good thing to learn about one of their people. And they were, the family is very generous in starting the donation process. Yeah. So how, how far along are you now uh, in, the do in, in getting donations? Well, here as we start the new year in 2018, we are right about 65, closing on 70% of our well, entire that's total. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, so we've really, we had a very nice uh, Christmas holiday. Ah, and yeah. as the community starts to understand and see this project, we've had some large organizations come on board. We're very thankful for uh, first of all, the USS Silversides Museum, as really the, the organizers of the start of this project, they helped fund 
and drive the initial uh, documentary project. When you say large donors, do you mean corporations, individuals? Or? Well, corporations, but again, not large amounts, and that's okay. Yeah. Yes, yeah. every project would like one person to come in and write a sweeping check. Yeah. But the fact that we have support from the Silversides Museum, from the LST Veterans Museum, mm -hmm. the MART Doc has been very gracious, uh, the Community Foundation, the Art Museum, the Lakeshore Center, all of these form a, a kind of a nucleus and really an energy that's helping this project come to fruition. Right, right. So you've got 30, 35% to go. How might someone make a donation? That is a great question. All donations are sent to the Community Foundation for Muskegon County. Okay, so if someone writes them a check and puts Clarence Zillman on it. Clarence Zillman, Boogie Woogie Bugle Boy, that guy with the trumpet, that wonderful Andrew song, any of those are going to get there. The money will go to the right place. It sure will. The Community Foundation for Muskegon uh, County, and that's at 425 West Western Street. Now, if, if uh, someone would want to contact you directly, what, what would be your phone number here at the college? We'd love to hear from anybody regarding this project. Uh, right here at Muskegon Community College, number 231-777-0639. All right, great. I'm, I'm sure the phones will be ringing. So, <laughs> but, uh, so, let's, let's, uh, so we know this is uh, happening. When will the final product be unveiled? We are very sure we've got a scheduled unveiling date, a dec uh, decoration date is kind of what we call this, um, November of 2018. Okay. November 11th is Veterans Day. Right. right. And that's a Sunday. We're lucky, there are many events that weekend, so we're looking to hold it on Saturday, November 10th. Saturday, November 10th. There'll be a public unveiling right downtown. So people can come and watch Oh, this. we clearly look forward to as many people coming as possible. And you'll probably have a little music given the occasion. We will have music. We've got a couple of speakers. There are some books that are being written, pamphlets about this. We'll learn a bit about the story of Clarence Zillman, but mostly just to honor a Muskegon favorite son. Yeah. Who in many ways uh, tapped out the notes that changed the war. The Boogie Wiggy right. Bugle Boy. Muskegon's finest. So one last thing before we go here. How did you even think of this project and to know about Clarence Zillman and uh, to do the documentary and now a statue? Every project starts at a small stage. I was in class teaching about World War II and I wanted to teach more than just bombs and bullets. Let's talk about the music of the era. So I put on some music from the Jimmy Dorsey Band. Mm -hmm. Have you students heard of this? No. All right, let's put on some Duke Ellington music. How about this, you guys? No. I'm a little frustrated with uh, students right yeah. now. <laughs> Here's a song you must have heard of. The Boogie Wiggy Bugle Boy of Company B by the Andrews Sisters. Well, by this time, about three hands go up after I play that. I'm not sure if they heard about it or just were Sensing my frustration. It's one of those you heard it once, you don't forget it. Correct. Well, probably they had. All right, so I'm ready to move on to other things. And one of the students in the back, on a cell phone, what a, what a surprise that'd be, yeah. says, this might have been written, but I think there's a Muskegon guy involved in this. I dismissed him instantly and moved on. I went back to my office and that kind of, kind of chewed on me a little bit and a little bit. And from there, that was the genesis, that student. That was the genesis of comment. investigation yeah. to make this. I never dreamed it would be a three-year journey of Clarence Zillman and this documentary. But more importantly, I'm so thrilled that this has become a piece of public art in our community. Yeah, it's pretty neat. Well, Kurt, thanks for being on the show, and thanks for uh, all the work you've done on this. Appreciate uh, you supporting this, Andy, so thank you very much. All right. And thank you, everyone, for uh, turn, tuning in to Timely Topics. We've had Kurt Troutman, who's a professor of history and political science here at the college, and we've been talking about Clarence Zillman, the Boogie Woogie Bugle Boy. Till next time, have a great day.